I'm going to start with a prop, which is uh, there was at the G8 summit a long communique published, but there's also a one-page summary called the Loch Earn Declaration. And I'm just going to, if you could pass it around, um, make sure everyone gets a copy. That would be great. Because what I'd, li I'd like to do for the next <coughs> 25 minutes is talk about the 10 components of that. Um, while it's going around, also to emphasize that the G8 presidency year for the UK was a year in which we did a number of events, not, not just the summit meeting itself, but there was a separate conference on food security and nutrition, where we gathered nearly $4 billion in pledges for meeting nutritional needs for uh, children. There was an event on impact investing, where we, again, put a lot of uh, effort together on impact increasing investment in social um, enterprise. There was an event on um, science, a uh, science minister's meeting where there was an agreement to tackle overuse of antibiotics, which is actually really important. It sounds very techy, but incredibly important for developing countries. Um, and there was an event on innovation and investment in innovation, which was uh, some really interesting new proposals, uh, projects launched on investing for um, developing countries. So there was a lot there, but the summit itself was focused on these three things of tax, trade, and transparency. And we tried to summarize, well, actually, Prime Minister Cameron personally tried to summarize in this note what the core elements um, were for a, a public, kind of in a form that could be easily read and, and understood by a wider public. So I'm just going to go through these 10 points fairly quickly and say a little bit about what was achieved and what we look forward to under each one. The first point is about tax information being shared around the world. The tax authorities across the world should automatically share information to fight the scour scourge of tax evasion. Um, so underneath that, there were two concrete actions that were mentioned in the communique. One of them in para paragraph 26 of the communique, there was mention of developing a new global standard um, on automatic sharing of information. And Lee will be able to say more about that and some of the work going into that. I'm sure Richard will as well. Um, so where we are with that is there are some pilots uh, following the US FATCA legislation. I say as a dual citizen, I still have the pleasure of complying with the FATCA legislation every year in my US tax returns. And um, I look forward to the rest of you complying as well. It'll be a great pleasure. Um, <clears throat> but basically, this standard is something which um, I, is one about exchange of information. But we're looking for a new global standard, which the OECD will lead by the end of 2014. And that was endorsed over the weekend, last weekend, by finance ministers at the G20, um, or finance ministers in paragraph 19 of their communique over last weekend. They endorsed this as a, as a forward um, agenda item. And having G20 endorsement for it is a huge help. I think this means is now this is, is very, very much going to happen. The second thing under point one, sharing information, is encouraging more jurisdictions to sign up to the multilateral convention, um, <coughs> which is again on sharing tax information. And there's a key component there about helping developing countries sign up and make sure there's a global process for getting more and more countries signed up. Moving on to point two of the Lochern Declaration, um, there's a really important point here about countries should change the rules that let companies shift their profits across borders to avoid taxes, and that multinationals should report to tax authorities what tax they pay where. This is simply a matter of improving um, taxation <coughs> of big companies. Um, and one of the action points under it set out in paragraph 25 of the communique is that we should move towards a common template for country by country reporting to tax authorities by multinationals. So basically, multinationals say which, how much tax they pay in each, in each country. A uh, concept that Richard had a big role in putting forward and, and fostering. And it's now in a G8 communique. So congratulations, Richard. Um, it's going to be taken forward in some OECD work on base erosion and profit shifting. And the base, er the base erosion and profit shifting action plan was published by the OECD after the G8 summit. And uh, this common template for reporting is contained at the end of action 13 of that base erosion and profit shifting report. 
and we look forward to that being implemented. There's still more to be done. A lot's going to depend on uh, the G20 continuing to push it. The third thing under that is there is something to be done about making sure that the, for the UK, for us domestically, that our overseas territories and our crown dependencies continue to keep pace with the UK reforms on, on these things um, and that there's good sharing of information. We could say some more about that later. So the, those, those are both things about tax. They are, as um, Chancellor of the Exchequer Osborne said, he felt that we achieved more in 24 hours than we had in the previous 24 years on tax uh, amend, uh, reform. So these are very promising. They're not yet delivered. There's a lot to do over the next two years, but this is, marks a big change in direction and a strong commitment by the G8 to make some very significant changes. Third, companies should know who really owns them. And I explained this one to my mother. And she said, well, what do you mean? Of course companies know who owns them. <laughs> well, actually, a lot of companies don't. Um, that you know, the beneficial ownership arrangements that prevail um, around the world um, mean that there's often a lack of transparency about ownership of companies. So companies should really know, know who owns them, and tax collectors and law enforcers should be able to obtain this information easily. So there's some specific actions under this um, on beneficial ownership. There are several um, parts of the communique which relate to it. I'm not going to go into the detail now, but if you're interested, the critical paragraph in the communique is paragraph 31, and the specific wording in paragraph 31 matters a lot because it's, it's very precise about what the obligations are. Um, it was, in some ways, one of the hardest parts of the communique to negotiate. It went down to the wire, went into the night at the summit to get agreement on it, and it's a very big change. Um, so what do we have to implement this? We have a set of principles at the end of the G8 summit about how beneficial, beneficial ownership action plans should be implemented. Those principles are really important for saying how transparency of company ownership will be taken forward. We have a commitment from the G8 that they will all produce action plans on how they're going to tackle transparency of company ownership. And we have, uh, so far, six of the eight G8 have published their action plans. We can go into more detail, but it's basically about introducing a stronger rule of transparency about company ownership. Third, or fourth, developing countries should have the information and capacity to collect the taxes owed to them. Um, oh, actually, you know, sorry, back to beneficial ownership. <laughs> this is really important. The UK is the first of the G8 to start consulting on how we're actually going to change the legislation. And we have a public consultation on what our beneficial ownership uh, policy should look like. And that consultation started, it opened last week. It closes on the 16th of September. So I strongly urge anyone who's interested to put in views on how our be beneficial ownership arrangements should be managed. Um, and there are discussions, for example, should it be a central registry of who owns companies? The, should it be a public registry or just available to enforcer, enforcers? Those are some of the questions that have to be addressed. The communique creates an obligation for uh, companies to obtain and hold information on who owns them. And the question then is how do you take that obligation and implement it effectively in UK law? So now, over the next few weeks, is a chance to really influence the way in which the UK legislates on this. Um, fourth, developing countries should have the information and capacity to collect taxes owed to them, and other countries have a duty to help them. This is, for developing countries, a very big challenge to have the right kind of skills and personnel and systems to be able to handle um, the information. It has enormous potential promise. If, 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 if that capacity could be developed and those skills implemented, developing countries should be able to enhance their tax base substantially. And as Kevin suggested, this is much more important than aid in the long run. This, is, this, is, this could be a big game changer. But there's a very, very big challenge on the capacity needs. They are enormous. And so the, o, the G8 committed to taking action on this, committed to supporting a new OECD uh, initiative called uh, Tax Inspectors Without Borders. But there's also long-term programs of capacity building. 
Um, as Christine will point out, there's a, the challenge of this is very, very big. Another thing that the, the communique uh, promised under this item four is a, um, to set up a database of comparable information that can be used by developing countries to challenge and understand and evaluate transfer pricing transactions. Um, so basically making the information available on market market rates for supply of goods and service goods and services that could be used to help trans challenge transfer pricing. So the GA have asked the OECD to produce a report and they're going to I think we produce it by the end of the year, we understand. Um, so that's potentially a powerful tool as well. And last under the, uh, this item four, there is a uh, an ongoing process which we're going to launch on anti-money laundering with working with both companies and governments, especially in Africa. And the first dialogue on this is going to happen in September in Namibia. We're going to have the first public-private dialogue on uh, anti-money laundering and look at obligations and how to implement them and how to tackle anti-money laundering initiatives in, in Africa. Five and six are about extractives, and there's a very big, so point five of the Law Current Declaration is that extractive companies should report payments to all governments, and governments should publish income from such companies. And six is that minerals should be sourced legitimately, not plundered from conflict zones. Most of our actions are actually under five. Um, six does relate uh, in part to the Kimberley initiative, um, Kimberley process, and the endorsement that got on the G8. Uh, those of you who are fans of the Kimberley process, we can talk in detail about definitions of conflict and how they're going to work through. Um, five, though, extractive companies should report payments. There are two dimensions to this. One is the Cardin Lugar legislation in the US and the follow on broader EU transparency and accounting directives, um, where basically the EU and the U.S. have agreed to require companies to report on how much they earn uh, from extractives production. The EU has gone further, has extended it to logging, not just uh, minerals and oil and gas, <coughs> which I think is, is great news. Some of the other G8 countries are not signed up. Uh, Canada has agreed to consult on this over the next two years. and. Um, I think that Japan and Russia are supportive of the other dimension of this, which is the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, EITI. And we had at the G8 an affirmation that the US, the UK, France, and Italy will join EITI. So that was four of the G8. Actually, the US had announced last year they were likely to, but um, four of the G8 countries joining EITI. Um, but also partnerships to implement extractives transparency in developing countries. And there are a number of partnerships between G8 uh, countries and developing countries. So a big push forward on more transparency about how much money is earned from extractive companies and you know, this, this enormous potential of transparency that you could, governments could see how much is being paid and citizens can see how much might be going astray. Seven, about land transactions should be transparent, respecting the property rights of local communities. This is, you know, there's lots of talk about land grabs and lack of good governance of land and people being displaced and lack of transactions being clear, transparent, again, beneficial ownership in land. So the G8 endorsed the voluntary guidelines developed by the UN and has put in place a series, or is putting in place now, a series of partnerships to implement those guidelines. But I think this is the start of a much longer process. And we expect Germany, when it, it chairs the G8 in two years' time, Germany will come back to this. And I expect we'll see the land transparency and the land better improved land governance, that moving forward over the next few years. Item eight is about trade. And <clears throat> it says that governments should roll back protectionism and agree new trade deals that boost jobs and growth worldwide. Implicit within that was a paradigm change that the G8 recognized, which is we're not looking just to the WTO to deliver on uh, trade liberalization. We recognize that free trade arrangements, um, bilateral ones and regional ones, also have a role to play. And there may be plurilateral and even unilateral agreements that make a difference. 
So basically the G8 said we're not going to – we will pursue all means necessary to pursue trade liberalization, but also endorsed a Bali – a deal in Bali on trade facilitation, which could have big implications for developing countries, um, reduce transaction costs enormously. Number nine, governments should cut wasteful bureaucracy at borders and make it easier and quicker to move goods between developing countries. There's a series of commitments about the G8 getting behind the African Union objective of reducing crossing times at borders by 50 percent and cutting in half those crossing times and doing this through better uh, trade facilitation measures, clearer rules, more consistent rules, but also infrastructure, and a commitment by the G8 countries that they would use several big multilateral processes to get behind trade facilitating infrastructure. Last, um, <clears throat> number 10, the, um, actually, I'm just wondering if there's anything else I need to say on trade. I, I th the other thing to say on trade is, is the obstacles to trade have changed a lot. Many of the obstacles are now behind the border. They're not tariff point obstacles. They're about regulations and harmonization of rules. And so the, the trade problem has changed even since the Doha round started. And I think this is the beginning of a recognition that the world is going to have to address trade in a slightly different way, more vigorous way. And number 10, uh, the communique has addended to it an open data charter which is a charter for the G8, which all the G8 countries have signed up to. It's a commitment to make government data available in a machine-readable, usable form, rather than just publishing it in PDF files or putting it out in forms that can't be, cannot be used. And the Open Data Charter contains within it a scale to assess the quality of data, a scale that was designed by Sir T uh, Tim Berners-Lee of World Wide Web, Web Inventor fame, and he did this for us and created this scale and we've endorsed it at the G8 and every G8 country is going to commit to a series of data sets that will comply with the standard but you know this is potentially a this is potentially a global standard and it could be very very empowering it could be transformative for giving information to citizens and NGOs in a way that can be converted into apps plugged into excel sheets can be crunched data that's actually usable instead of data that is just published. So we might in 10 years' time look back on this and say actually that was the single most important thing even though it's had the least attention. Uh, uh, and I, I, on the transparency, there was a commitment also on uh, aid transparency and a commitment from all of the G8 to uh, make progress on the International Aid Transparency Initiative Standard, which was the first time we've got that secured. There are other things that are not listed on these 10. There is um, the Deauville Partnership on helping countries in the Arab world, and particularly on asset recovery, is a very, very big um, line of work, something that we're going to be working on the rest of this, this year. Um, asset recovery is where there are assets that have been stolen and they've been stashed in the bank accounts of other countries, finding ways to empower the original owners to get those assets back is an incredibly important part of it. Um, in sum, this, this G8 summit took on a whole series of policy changes. None of them are finished. Um, things like the Open Data Charter are really in the, you know, solid standards, but many, many of these things we've, we've set out an ambition, we've secured agreement from all the G8 to take action, and there's more action left to be taken over the next few years. Um, the G8 alone is not going to deliver it, the G20 is absolutely critical in this, especially on the tax things. Um, and the G20 summit in St. Petersburg in September will be an important moment to take this forward. And the work that the OEC is doing, OECD is doing, especially under base erosion and profit shifting, is going to be important. Um, there's, so there's a forward political trajectory for the next three to five years, um, which are gonna, it's gonna make a big difference. And uh, so the real question about the, this G8 summit I would submit was a turning point, but Actually, delivering on it is going to take some more effort over the coming years. I'll stop at that. Thanks, Kevin.